奠定了他的商业插画风格。他在布鲁克林 Pencil Factory 楼里面拥有工作室，也长期为 Etsy 工作，同时任教于 p r a t University。他的作品发表于 Adobe 快公司、Intel、纽约客等等。所以，呃，他的作品会呃很有意思，因为他非常平面，但是同时他又有商业的价值，同时又非常艺术。所以，呃，我们欢迎金卫，然后给大家做一个 presentation。Okay, so I'm going to do this presentation in English. Okay, hello. Um, thank you for your patience and thanks to the school for inviting me. It's awesome to be here. Uh, my name is Jing, and I primarily work as a commercial illustrator. I do a lot of editorial work along with advertising and branding, so a few different branches. And for this talk, I'm going to actually be talking about only two projects in particular. Um, so a little bit of background, as Fofo mentioned, I was born in Shenyang, but I moved to America when I was seven. So as I was trying to immerse myself in this new culture, uh, art was something that was a consistent element in my life. So as a result, I gravitated more toward that than any other discipline. Uh, so that's how I decided to become an illustrator, try to make that into a career for myself. Uh, I went to art school and I graduated in 2008. And since then, it's taken me a while to figure out what it is that I like and more importantly, what it is that I'm good at. So after I graduated, I moved to New York, um, and the economy was actually pretty terrible at the time, so it was really hard for me to start getting steady work and steady commissions from clients. Um, but having a studio actually really helped me get organized, and I uh, felt like once I had a space that was more of a, a, more of a professional setting, uh, that was able to, uh, I was able to take a more serious approach to freelance. So having that overhead also created a little bit of pressure, and so I had to promote myself to reach out to clients and start getting new work. Um, we talked about this a little bit in the panel earlier, but the act of self-promotion is actually very important for American illustrators. Uh, when you're younger, you do always have this concept of a naturally shy person, um, because it's ultimately for your work. Uh, one client that I really wanted to work with, and I've always wanted to work with, was the New York Times. So I emailed one of the art directors um, from a contact, and I went in for a meeting. And even though it took them a whole year to call me and hire me, I felt like it was still good to take that first step, because if I hadn't reached out to them, maybe they would have never hired me at all. Um, but since then, they've actually become one of my favorite clients, and I've worked with them on some of my favorite pieces, uh, including this series. Uh, they really see me grow as an illustrator, which I feel like is a very cool thing to have um, because that kind of history builds a lot of trust and it gives me room to stretch and grow and try new things with them. Uh, this is a series for the science fiction column in the book review section. And the subject matter is a little bit strange, uh, which is what I really like about it. Uh, a new client probably wouldn't look at my normal work and think sci-fi, but an art director who has worked with you for a really long time can really see the potential. So it kind of creates this cool unknown territory where it feels like something new and experimental might be able to arise. Um, the subject matter for these pieces are all pretty similar. I do these about once a month and a half. 
Um, and so, since it's science fiction, it's all kind of in the same world. Uh, it deals with topics like distant planets and strange alien creatures, uh, dystopian universes. So it's all stuff that doesn't really have a physical point of reference, which I think is really cool because I can't just Google that and um, find something that I can like draw off of. It really lends itself to a lot of invention and imagination. Um, when I'm working on the series, I like to think that I'm continuing to build scenes in a very specific world. Uh, I try to find a consistent mood and I make sure that every piece speaks to the one that came before and the one that comes after. And it definitely helps that all of these prompts come from the same genre and I can easily see these characters traveling from one world to the next. Uh, sometimes the subject matter can be a little bit dark and I think that can be tricky to balance while staying true to my sensibilities because I'm not a particularly aggressive person, I'm actually like a very soft, kind person. Um, but I also don't want to shy away from any subject matter because I want to be able to tackle it all. So um, I'd love to draw more death and monsters actually because I feel like for me personally I haven't fully figured out how to exactly draw these things. So it's a continuing challenge for me. Um, but a lot of that exploration begins with sketching, and my process is pretty sim similar uh, to Lisk and June's and some of the other artists that you've seen earlier. I like to keep a sketchbook with me at all times because I like having all of my ideas in one place. I can just easily go back and refer to it um, anytime I want. And uh, I also feel like any time that I can have away from a screen is really good because I feel like I'm just looking at screens all the time. So it's very comforting to be able to just sit down and draw on a piece of paper sometimes. Um, I always start by writing down a list of words and phrases that jump out at me from the article because I feel like it really helps me get to the heart of the piece and I can quickly translate those words into imagery and just get ideas down really quickly. Um, and then that leads to a bunch of really loose thumbnails just so I can get a general idea and composition down without wasting that much time on being precious about the drawing. So I think that then leads me to um, having tighter more selective sketches. And I usually send in about three to five drawings for this particular series. And once I have the final drawing, it's actually pretty smooth sailing from there. Um, I always work out the image in black and white before I start making any color decisions. My background is actually in printmaking, so I used to do a lot of woodcuts. Um, and I think that still to this day, I'm used to thinking about an image in terms of value and breaking it down by color separations. So I actually don't go through too many rounds of color because once I've determined the value, then the piece sort of works. Uh, I don't know, color just comes really easily from there. Uh, these are a few, a bunch of unused sketches actually for another series, um, but it's just to show a bit more of my process because for every finished piece there are, there's a ton of unused work that never sees the light of day. And I think that that's often more interesting than the actual finished piece because the exploration that gets there, um, it might include some weird ideas that you could use later on. Uh, so I hope to come back to some of these unused ideas and concepts in the future for other projects. Um, so I do have a pretty solid process down at this point, but one thing that does get in the way of my process is procrastination, which is, I'm sure, something a lot of you guys can relate to. Um, I'm definitely somebody who works best under a deadline, and I really, really need that pressure in order to get my best ideas out, which definitely doesn't feel super healthy, but it's just the way that I've found I work best. Um, this basically sums up my process for every project. I'm not sure if you guys can read this, uh, but this is basically just kind of a horrible graph of how I manage my time. Um, everyone has a different way of working, so you just kind of have to figure out your path to getting to your best ideas. And this unfortunately happens to be mine. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, if you like to stay up late, if you like to cram, then sometimes it's good to balance out those habits with uh, 
with other things like uh, taking a break if you feel burnt out or doing paperwork when you don't feel like drawing. Okay, so that was some of my freelance stuff, and now I'm going to talk about a completely different body of work. Um, and actually, one thing that does help me stay on task is working with other people. Um, for the past three years, I've been illustrating for a company called Etsy uh, on their brand design team. So it's a very different kind of illustration work, but it does stem from similar roots. Um, Etsy is, if you guys don't know, it's an online platform for selling um, handmade and vintage goods. So it's essentially a company that supports artists and small businesses and startups. Uh, and my role at the company is illustration director, uh, which means I either create or I oversee all of the illustrations for the company. Um, and it's a really, as I mentioned before, it's a really prominent time for tech companies right now, especially in America. And every tech company is now starting to value uh, and use illustration more and more because Every company wants a brand presence, and as a result of having that brand presence, they need a unique perspective and a unique voice. Um, so an internal brand team generally consists of a lot of different roles. Um, usually there are creative directors, art directors, graphic designers, copywriters, uh, project managers. It's just like a whole mix of people and different perspectives. Uh, so a lot goes into making a living, breathing brand work. Um, one thing that is also different from freelance is that I can't make something and be done with it, so it's hard for me to move on from a project because it's something that you constantly need to update um, and revise, and it's all part of a system. And I'm collaborating with people constantly, so I can't really be working as an individual or in a silo. Uh, everything I do is part of a bigger whole, and once I make something, it can be used or broken apart or repurposed by a designer, and it no longer belongs to me or anyone, really. Um, and it took me a while to get used to this concept because you kind of have to put your ego aside a little bit to uh, become to go in-house, basically. So you kind of have to think about what's best for the project versus what's necessarily best for you personally. Um, day to day, I'm making things for the website, apps, internal offices, and offline campaigns. Um, this is an example of the spot library that I've been building up for them. So uh, basically, this exists at all times for designers to pull from. Uh, and sometimes the images can be very practical and functional because it has to work with fairly dry concepts like shipping and opening a shop um, and sustainability. But uh, that said, some of the projects can actually be really fun and challenging, um, and I feel lucky that I get to shape that to some extent. I've painted murals in a few of the office locations at this point, and prior to this, I had never done a mural before in my life, so I really took this as like an opportunity to do something that I felt like was personally challenging and fulfilling. So these are offices that I've painted in San Francisco, Dublin, and recently London. I couldn't find a London video that wasn't, that didn't have text on it, so this was part of my Instagram stories at some point. <laughs> uh, the office that I work in is definitely uh, different than my personal studio. It's bigger, it's cleaner, it's more of a controlled space. And I actually like having access to two different work env environments because I feel like uh, a change in where you work could also inspire new ways of thinking. Um, and there are certain kinds of projects that I love doing at Etsy that I feel like would be hard to accomplish in my studio and also vice versa. Uh, last year, the company moved to its new headquarters in Brooklyn and I got to illustrate the entire facade of the building along with interior signage to help you navigate the space. And it was a totally new challenge, um, both working at this scale and also dealing with the variation in materials. Uh, and when I was first introduced to the project, the brief was just pages and pages of graphics that looked like this, which really meant nothing to me, so I was really overwhelmed and I didn't know how to start going about this. 
Um, but after going through my usual procrastination process, I realized that I was going to start it the same way I started any project, which was with ideas and drawings and sketches. Um, so I started gathering stories within the company and also drawing upon my own experiences uh, through emails and conversation, and I compiled it uh, and funneled it into these drawings. So this is sort of a tapestry of every Etsy moment that I could think of, basically, um, and something that I felt like really described the essence of the culture. And after those drawings were finalized, we went into rounds of prototyping, which was just printing things at scale so that you could see what it actually looked like when the drawings were huge versus, you know, something in a, like a eight by 10 sketchbook. Um, so there are a lot of tweaking and adjustments and back and forth um, between the sketch process and the prototyping process. And eventually we were able to approve the final drawing, vectorize it, and then move on to uh, doing material tests. So I have to admit that the permanence of this thing was extremely intimidating at first, but um, after I found a way into the project, it just became another list of to-dos. Uh, so those drawings were eventually CNC routed, I don't know how to translate that, um, into the side of these concrete columns. Um, another thing about this project was that it was very scary for me to strip down my work into just a line drawing, essentially. Uh, there were no textures or shapes or anything that I would normally have in my work uh, that makes it feel personal to me. Um, but I also found that uh, the image kind of takes on a different life when it's produced in uh, a very specific material. And sometimes that can be really pleasantly surprising because it brings a different energy to the drawing. So ultimately, this was really cool to see. Um, this was another drawing that uh, kind of described the, uh, I guess, objects and also things that you might find in the Etsy universe. Uh, and that eventually became laser cut into a gate that opens up in the middle. So it's kind of like I'm just filling bits and pieces of this building right now. Uh, and another one of the deliverables was a mural on the ceiling of our entryway. So I had to think of something that was fun, but also somewhat abstract. Uh, so a pattern was the first thing that came to mind because it was something that uh, it could really dominate a space, but it wasn't immediately recognizable, which I thought was a nice balance. Um, and this sketch on the left actually started out as an unused pattern for something else. Um, and I originally threw it in the deck of concepts just to have an extra idea in there. Um, but of course, that's the one that the team picked. So that's the one that I ended up going with. And um, yeah, before I knew it, I was drawing the land of unicorns. And then that was, again, vectorized and taken uh, into production and painted onto the ceiling of our entryway. So this was pretty crazy to see installed, but it's really exciting to see something that started out so small as a thumbnail in your sketchbook um, and completely blown up into something that's so permanent and humongous. So, just a little bonus. Um, so yeah, that's something that I actually really appreciate about working in-house at a company because um, you feel the energy of the office and you can feel the energy of your teammates because when this building was made, everyone was so happy about um, the artwork and how much presence it had in the space. So I was actually really surprised because I thought the artwork was kind of weird for a corporate office, but there was such an enthusiasm from all of the admin for this weirdness that uh, I, feel, I feel like that was really rare and awesome for a company of that size. So um, that actually is now one of my goals is to always be finding companies that supports and fosters that weirdness because that's like the best situation basically. Uh, coming out of school, I really felt pressure to choose just one thing and do that one thing really well. Uh, I really just narrow my focus. 
And then Etsy really completely came out of left field. And when I first started working there, I actually felt like the two worlds were constantly competing um, as opposed to being integrated into the same path. But now I realize that I actually don't want one path at all. Um, I kind of want to be trying as many different things as possible uh, and finding opportunities to extend my projects. So right now I'm more interested in scale and material and application and how all of that can change the way your illustrations look and feel. Um, so I'm trying to take on projects that bring a new perspective and interaction to my work. Uh, for example, how do you design for something that's wearable versus something that's completely functional and used as a mode of transportation? Um, what does the work look like when it's in 3D versus a moving image? I'm still working on my animation skills. And what do I do when there are no project constraints and I'm just making something for fun? Uh, these are all questions that I want to explore further. And I think that this chart pretty much describes my current aspirations. Uh, so I feel like it's really good to know and establish your skill level and gain confidence in what you do. And then I think it's really good to find that challenging place that feels like it's just a little bit beyond your capabilities and a little bit beyond your reach. Um, but I think embracing that challenge and moving toward that place is ultimately the goal, um, at least for me right now. So I feel like it's the best way to make sure that you're moving forward and growing in your work. Uh, yeah, and plus you never know what, my, what you might come up with. So, yeah, that's all. Thank you for listening. Uh 所有的东西都是可以被称为插画的并没有说一定要画童书或者是一定要做某一个特别的东西那才是在从事插画行业 然后Josh 今年也担任了2017年纽约插画协会评委会主席。让我们大家欢迎Josh Cogren. Hi guys. Um, thank you, Lisk, and uh, thank you, China Academy of Art, for uh, inviting us to come and share our work with you. Um, I am an illustrator working in Brooklyn, and uh, like Liz said, a lot of my clients are in editorial, advertising, and books, and I also do uh, murals as well. Um, and I'm just going to share a little bit about how I got started. So, um, like what was mentioned <laughs> earlier, I thought this would be hilarious for you guys in, in, here in China to see a comic. Uh, done by uh, Hershen, uh, who did uh, Tintin. Um, basically, I, I grew up in Taiwan, in, and I went to a missionary school, uh, and we were not allowed to read 
American comics because uh, all the superheroes were, um, you know, wearing really skin tight clothing. But instead, we had a lot of uh, comics like uh, Tintin, and this is was my probably one of my earliest influences into uh, graphic arts. Um, and one thing that I loved about Tintin was just how simple uh, everyone's faces were and how detailed and complex the backgrounds are. Um, and I thought that that was something that I liked because um, all of a sudden you could kind of see yourself as Tintin, you know, because his face was so abstract and simplified. Um, I also moved around a lot as a child. Uh, I, I came over to the States when I was 11, and uh, I lived in California, Southern California, a little bit after that um, in high school, and um, here I was exposed to a lot of uh, modernism and artists such as uh, David Hockney. So I kind of had this uh, sort of a mix of different cultures inside of me and, and uh, it's, it's interesting now kind of like as an adult to see how uh, a lot of my, uh, my work has kind of stemmed from this. I also went to school in uh, California at uh, the Art Center in Pasadena and uh, here I learned about classic graphic design in America like this is uh, Seymour Quast who is a uh, sort of a New York legend, and um, I love the influence of graphic design and illustration, and I think that this was something, you know, for, for me the, the parallels here between this and David Hockney and uh, Tintin was just, uh, there was definitely some sort of thread going through uh, all these different things. So in school, I, uh, I learned a lot of techn technical skills like painting and drawing and learning how to like work realistically. But the one thing that I loved the most was uh, printmaking. And the thing that I liked about printmaking was that it was very step by step and there was a process to it. Um, it's sometimes it was really nice that once you have an idea that you had to follow certain things in order to have an image later on that uh, um, was a little bit unpredictable based on how you uh, approach the process. This is the first assignment I ever got, and this was from the New York Times op-ed page, which uh, I think we spoke quite a bit about. Um, this this uh, page runs a lot of illustrations every single day, and it's a really good way for newcomers to get started uh, in America doing illustration because they take a lot of new illustrators and they like to try people out this way. It doesn't pay a lot of money um, and uh, the time frame is really, really short, like sometimes uh, half a day. So um, it was a really good experience for me to learn how to work commercially. Um, the first time I came to New York, I think that there were some questions during the panel about how we got our first jobs or how we got exposure. And um, basically I got a list. There's uh, people that graduated um, before me had a list of art directors and I would go down the list and just call these art directors and sometimes I would lie and say I had an appointment and uh, just show up and have my portfolio and I would show them um, kind of what I was up to. And a lot of times, uh, you know, they would be really confused but uh, they would eventually sort of be forced to look at my work and um, I actually would not recommend you doing that now because I think that was, it was actually kind of rude and might not really have helped my career that much. Uh, I find that illustration can be a really useful tool in explaining really complicated topics. Um, so when I was first getting started out, I uh, I found myself doing assignments for really dry topics, like this one for instance was for a business magazine about different levels of a company being unable to communicate with each other. Um, but for me, I really wanted to just draw 
what I was interested in and for me like in this instance I was just really interested in drawing like kind of a complicated wave pattern and um, I found a lot of joy in in uh, describing little moments on this bridge or you know um, kind of getting lost in drawing the little little people and uh, mechanics um, this is another illustration for a, a book review for the New York Times. This was the, um, a book review on a self-help book about maintaining a positive public image. And um, I, uh, I really, I, again, I really wanted to kind of describe this uh, feeling of a vinyl, a deflated vinyl balloon, and I think that was something that was really interested, interesting for me as the assignment. Um, this one is for a financial magazine about uh, new real estate. I, I find that when I am um, challenged with an assignment, um, I, I need to find something in the assignment that will make it uh, interesting or uh, something about it that will surprise me with the, with, with the process. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about my process. Uh, I oftentimes have a hard time coming up with ideas. And I think that going back to what I was talking about earlier with printmaking, um, I, I really think that having a process or having a list of things to do is what helps me come up with ideas. I often find that when I'm just sitting there and uh, kind of like what Jing was saying earlier, when you're just sitting there with like a blank piece of paper and you're just trying to come up with ideas, I never am able to come up with anything. But then if I'm sitting there and I just start drawing, then naturally ideas will come out of the act of drawing. And I think that is something that um, has been really important with how I uh, approach my work. So, uh, you know, for, for many years I was doing illustrations for these uh, business magazines and just trying to um, uh, make a living being an illustrator, but I started to find myself uh, losing touch with my process. Uh, the enjoyment that I used to get from working on assignments uh, just started to fade, you know, like I was drawing the same wave pattern, I was drawing like, uh, you know, the same sort of composition with the trees, or... Uh, that, the thing about once you have a few successes, uh, art directors tend to uh, call you to, to repeat yourself often. And uh, just like anything else in life, I think once I start to do the same thing a few times, I just get sick of it naturally. So um, because of this, I wanted to get back in touch with my art school roots. I uh, had an idea to work, uh, sort of go back to work with drawing with a figure, and I wanted to do life drawing again. But instead of hiring a model, I uh, teamed up with my studio mate to ask people on um, uh, Twitter and Instagram to come and to our studio and pose for us. So it was a really uh, interesting experiment because these people that were just sort of like art directors or editors or friends of ours or um, even other studio mates would come and pose for us and everyone's really you know nervous and stressed out. Uh, but it created a uh, another layer of um, anxiety that I was able to uh, feed off of and um, and work from. So basically, we set up this uh, two days straight of drawing from these different um, people, and uh, because there were so many people lined up, and we just kind of spread out a lot of different art materials there, we were just forced to create work very, very fast. And I didn't have any time to overthink something, or I didn't have any time to like worry too much about if, if this is the right thing that I was making, or if this line looked good, or uh, am I using the right colors. And I think because of that reason, I was able to make work that felt a little bit more honest to me. 
Um, another, another approach that I have to making art uh, that is interesting is this idea of mass drawing. And um, uh, this is just another way to get around from planning out a, a piece too much. So sometimes I'll just start in the upper left-hand corner because I'm right-handed and I'll just draw out, you know, without stopping. And uh, uh, I think when I do that, I don't really think too much about how, you know, things lay out or how uh, um, certain things look. And I just try to block everything out and just focus on that drawing. So this is a spread from a, a children's book that I, I published about New York City interiors. Um, another way I like to work is by trying to recreate a certain moment or feeling. Um, oftentimes I get easily bored with uh, conceptual illustrations of, you know, like a businessman climbing a dollar bill or like, it, you know, in, in American illustration I think that is a very common way to uh, approach um, uh, an article or storytelling. So sometimes it's, it's really nice to sort of flip it and uh, do a very simple moment, you know, like this is a, a sculpture in upstate New York by uh, the artist Richard Serra, and it is uh, built with this um, really amazing steel. Uh, this is also from the same series. This is a young couple looking at a painting by uh, Philip Gustin. I try to find ways that illustration can do more than what photographs can do. Um, sometimes it's great to use tools like surrealism in my work. Um, this is a drawing of my bedroom that I did on the theme of silence. I like to oftentimes incorporate memories um, or uh, um, certain events in my life. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a drawing that I did after uh, I got a new apartment. Um, I did this piece after the recent um, presidential election in my country. <laughs> Um, I find that I do better work when I'm emotionally involved or when I feel angry or feel happy or if I have an extreme emotion to uh, the subject matter. Um, finally, I'd like to share some of the, mo the most important aspect of my process. I try to take things that I'm not quite sure I could pull off successfully. I think uh, Jing mentioned this earlier. Um, I, I think I do better when I am presented with a problem that I totally have no idea how I can do. So this is a, a project that I did with uh, um, this soda company called Mountain Dew. I'm not sure if you guys have this here in China, but it's it's kind of horrible, actually, but um, it was a really fun assignment. I worked with a, uh, a company in New York called Buck. Oop. There's sound on this, but you can just sort of hear it. I also got to draw myself here. Um, six years ago, I got asked to create a large-scale mural on the side of a building by a gallery in Copenhagen in Denmark. Uh, I had absolutely no experience doing large-scale work or murals, um, but the gallery was like, hey, we got this you know, massive wall, do you want to do it? Do you know how to do a mural like this? And I just, and I just totally lied and I said I knew what I was doing. Um, and I think that's sort of a philosophy that I've tried to maintain throughout my career is just fake it a little bit until you're able to kind of figure it out. Um, 
so, uh, so I was creating this mural, you know, I had five days to do it, and uh, during the same week, um, um, this uh, famous American graffiti artist, Shepard Ferry, I don't know if you guys know who he is, but he created the uh, Obey Giant um, graffiti campaign in, uh, in the States. And uh, we both got interviewed by the same uh, Danish newspaper. So we had interviews side by side there. And that same week, he got in a fight at a bar. And this was also during the time that um, uh, America and Denmark was like kind of not, I don't, I don't, I don't I'm not quite sure what it was, but um, it was just, America didn't look that good to uh, a lot of Danish people there. So he got in a fight at a bar and um, someone came and graffitied across his mural because he was doing a mural at the same time and said, Yankee hipster, go home. And the same night, the same, that person came and did the same graffiti on my wall just as I was finishing up my wall. Um, so I was like, you know, I was like really stressed out, you know, I didn't know what to do. Um, I tried to also keep this, uh, my image fairly simple because, you know, this was my first mural and um, I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, but inside I was also really secretly happy because it kind of felt like I was just as famous as Shepard Fairey, like someone hated me enough to, to get up on my wall to graffiti it. Um, and uh, this is the this is the finished one that we did uh, the next day. Um, I learned the most about working on murals uh, for this project for U.S. Open. I was asked to create a mural in real time as the tournament progressed. The tournament took place over 15 days, and um, basically at the end of every day something would happen, and I would have to go up on the wall and uh, and. Paint it. I couldn't have an assistant. I had to do everything myself, and so, you know, like with the with the Danish um, mural, I was like really nervous, and I wanted to be very careful. But this one, it was like I had no time to do anything, so I just had to like just kind of go for it. I did in my neighborhood in Brooklyn about all the different uh, kinds of people that are living there. And uh, this is a recent piece I did for uh, this hamburger chain uh, called Shake Shack in uh, New York's Penn Station. It is probably one of the most disgusting subway stations you've ever been to. I don't know if anyone here has ever been to that train station, but 
Uh, we call it a rat's nest because it's all underground and it's really, really dirty. Uh, everyone's in a rush, no one cares. Uh, you know, like, you could be hurt there on the side and people wouldn't even look at you. Uh, but I actually wanted to try to isolate various interesting moments and um, try to find something that made the, the train station interesting. This is uh, the uh, finished version at uh, Shake Shack. So I guess, um, I guess sort of my takeaway here is that you know, when, when that gallery asked me to do the mural in Copenhagen, you know, I, I wasn't good enough to do it. And I think that when the US Open asked me to do that mural, I, I also wasn't good enough to do that, but I sort of faked it. Um, and I think that it's important to sort of ignore that voice inside of you that says that you can't do that project. Because the more you do something, the better you get at it. I think there's just no way around that. And uh, this is what I love about making large-scale work. You know, there is just so much space you need to cover. And just like printmaking, uh, just like illustration, that there, there is like a step-by-step -step process that you have to do. And there's no time to overthink it. There's no time to question yourself or to uh, listen to voices inside of you that says you can't do it. And you just have to kind of focus and get the job done. And I think that's something that hopefully uh, everyone here can take away and apply to, to what they do. This is a mural that I did for the uh, Boy Scouts in West Virginia. Thank you.今天其实我们的讲座其实已经结束但我想说几句话因为我刚刚听得非常热血沸腾我是没有接触过那个东西的我现在觉得就是说这个点我还蛮触动的其实你有时候你即使不会你也可以先答应所以我觉得如果你们想要从事插画的话一个不是很恰当的比喻<笑>好那谢谢大家今天的光临然后我们<笑>